bigger than the other one. Not only one, but two in the Look at those gills. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for spotting that one. Hello there, nature lovers. Bob Ellis here with another episode of Notes from the Field Street. Yeah, we are right downtown Prescott, Arizona, and we are checking out a hot claim. I got an email from a friend of the Institute, Mark Dorston, who says that he has seen salamander larvae in Granite Creek, right downtown Prescott. I'm kind of doubting this claim just a little bit because Granite Creek is channelized and it's also the recipient of no small amount of non-point source pollution from this very street. And it's an ephemeral stream. That's right. It dries up for part of the year. So kind of doubting this claim and just to verify, I've brought along a salamander expert. As a matter of fact, she has a PhD in salamanders. And interestingly enough, she is our new program director at the Natural History Institute. I'd like for you to meet Jesse Rack, salamander expert. Jesse and I are going to go down here and check out this hot claim. I mean, look at this creek. Come on, let's go. His little face looks like. I'm gonna put it back in the water so it gets a little breath. <gasps> okay, so we have successfully caught a larval salamander. This is a tiger salamander. Um, and so it's Ambisimum avortium is its species. There are three different subspecies of this guy in Arizona, two of which are native, one is non-native. And I know for sure it's not one of them, the Sonoran tiger salamander, which exists down on the border, but I can't guarantee without genetic analysis that it's not one of the other two. So basically what it could be is the Arizona tiger salamander, Ambistoma mavordium subspecies nebulosum, or the um, western a uh, barred salamander, which is the barred tiger salamander, which is non-native. That's introduced um, mostly by fishermen, and those two also interbreed, so it's difficult to know. But So this is what's cool about salamander larvae. So I know this is a baby because it has external gills, so you can see them out in the water. So amphibians are awesome because they have a multi-stage life cycle. So they start, they hatch out of an egg, like picture a frog egg, and then they have this aquatic larval stage, which grows legs, just like a tadpole would. Um, and they use those gills to get oxygen out of the water. And then eventually, when they're ready to metamorphose into an adult terrestrial version, they um, absorb those gills and then climb out on land. Uh, and these, this group, this genus, is called a mole salamander because they spend three quarters of the year living underwater, or living underground, and then only come out to breed, basically. And so the babies, live in water. What's really cool about these guys is sometimes they have another strategy they use where they're not just in, um, they're not just aquatic larvae and terrestrial adults. Sometimes if conditions aren't great on land, they have a third strategy which is called um, a neotenic form, which means just like if you're familiar with the axolotl um, or ashalot, uh, those guys have, they look like larvae as adults and so they retain larval characteristics as adult salamanders yet are able to breed. Um, I, su su I suspect this one is not a, ne a neotenic version because it's still very small um, relatively for this species. So a neotenic form would probably be like 
way longer, like eight inches or more. Um, just a baby. If you've ever touched a frog or, or a salamander, you know that it's kind of sticky and wet, right? And that's because they do a lot of exchange of fluids and gases with their skin. The adults do gas exchange. Um, and so the skin's just really permeable. So it's important to not um, have to have your hands very clean and washed if you are going to handle them. Um, it's important to not have any kind of chemicals on your hands and to really minimize the amount of time you spend touching them because even the oils on your hands can um, can affect them. So uh, I'm handling this little guy minimally, uh, but it's important to think about. Um, and amphibians, because of this permeable skin, they're often very susceptible to chemicals in their environment. They're susceptible to drastic environmental changes. And so they're considered uh, a very strong indicator of climate change because of how, how they are affected by very small changes in temperature and in um, salinity and in you know, pH of where they're living. So, oh my gosh. One other cool thing that can happen with the tiger salamander, um, and so as, as an adult, these are the largest terrestrial salamander in North America, which is bonkers. And so what's cool about them, there's actually two different kinds of larvae, and one of them is pretty rare, it's a cannibalistic morph. And so if this little, salamander baby had hatched out in an environment with a lot of competition, so a lot of other salamanders all in a small place, um, then what happens is sometimes some of them will adopt this strategy where they turn into cannibals and they eat specifically other tiger salamander larvae. Um, and it what happens is it changes them morphologically, so their body changes. Their heads get broader and they have teeth, yes they have teeth, um, their teeth get like sharper and more pointy, uh, you should google this, um, and it's, it's a, a good adaptive strategy if you're in an environment like that because for one thing, if you're in a really crowded environment in Arizona, it's probably because the pond is drying. And so you want to take in as much protein and grow as fast as you can so that you can metamorphose sooner and get out of the pond. That's what you're trying to do. In this environment, in this creek, there's probably lots of space. We've only seen a handful. And I tried to stick my finger in its mouth and I didn't see any big teeth. So I think it's fun. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> well, it looks like that hot claim turned out to be true. There are salamanders in an urban creek that is seasonal. So what this tells me is that Natural history is everywhere, and it's for everybody. So I'm gonna encourage you, no matter where you live, to get out, look around into nature, and maybe you'll find some hot claim that you want us to check. And I'll tell you what, we'll get right on it. So thanks for watching, hit that subscribe button, and go ahead and put those claims right there in the comments section. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.